On June 2nd and 3rd, 2011, the Center for Design and Geopolitics held its first annual conference in La Jolla at CalIT2, the California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. So the promise and peril of this. Um, in Jeff's um, last remarks, um, fantastic presentation, he touched on an idea of um, geometry, and really I think what we're talking about here in this, um, the kinds of transformations of work is a transformation in the geometry of geography, particularly political geography, which is to say, in a way, topology, and the topol in, a, in a perhaps a recognition that the political geographies we've inherited have a particular topological framework that we may have taken for granted, but in ways now appear to us as perhaps unusual and alien and now more malleable. And one of the sets of topological frameworks in which we find ourselves uh, located um, and locating is that of networks. Um, and we see then in a way that the, the long shadow of the Treaty of Westphalia, which drew a particular kind of territory, a particular kind of geometry of geography over the crust of the earth, but not importantly, its oceans, provided a, a particular two-dimensional diagram on a linear plane and populated this diagram with leagues of envelope states, curving lines which segmented that plane and framed sovereignty by a kind of formal involution, simultaneously excluding membership at the same, uh, at, with the same line that became the naturalized border. So that co apparent coherency of the nation state as a world historical actor and as a discrete methodological unit for analysis in a way derives from that diagram, that topology, that ge geometric superimposition. And for better or worse, Kant's subsequent cosmopolitan model, which as we, you know, it's, it's worth noting emerged from, really from his lectures on geography, is a federalization of these sovereign states, ag an aggregation of them into a kind of transcendental architecture which would universalize the legal and territorial claims upon which that diagram would, would derive its ethical validity. Um, but not only is that geometry in ways transforming, mutating, evolving, perforating, segmenting um, in ways that we um, are beginning to make sense of, that the capacity of thinking about cosmopolitanism or about the shared condition of being a political, ethical mammal that shares this surface of this earth structure and the kinds of polities we would derive from that can't depend upon that geog geometry anymore. That centripetal scaling doesn't really hold. So for today, what are the available techniques? Um, the network, you know, the, 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 the first decade of the 21st century, in a way, will probably be looked back upon, remarked as a moment in which the conceptual hegemony of network topologies is what described and mobilized, in many ways, our understanding of complex systems. Everything becomes a network. Everything is described as a network. From information globalization to immunology to, to re from response marketing to popular uprisings. But if the network topology of the modern institutional history, the one that Kant was writing about, was one of nodes which produced edges, dominated edges, perhaps our multipolar, some would say nonpolar global territory is one for which edges in turn produce and dominate nodes. So networks, the topology with which we have, the alphabet with which we work, what is the promise, what is the peril, what is the synthesis, what is the critical topology, the critical topological imaginary that um, that we can pursue for them and through them. Now, the first person on this is probably the, the person who knows far more about networks than any, than any of us, truly one of the real pioneers of network science. Um, and for a discussion around the connections of networks as a sociological and a political issue, no one uh, is perhaps more qualified to speak to this than James Fowler, who's professor here both in the School of Medicine and in the School of Social Sciences in the Political Science Department uh, simultaneously. A, he was a fellow uh, um, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. James was named one of foreign policy's top 100 global thinkers. His, and his work, as I indicated, really lies at this intersection of natural and social sciences around the problematic of the network. 
His areas of research include social networks, we understand them, behavioral economics, evolutionary game theory, and, 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 and um, political participation, cooperation, and what he calls genopolitics. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce James Fowler. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful conference. It's um, so interesting to see people from such different fields trying to come together and thinking about what's next. Um, today, I want to do this by thinking, first of all, about uh, a picture that you guys might be familiar with from your own experience on Facebook. And as soon as it comes up here, you'll see that, that, that we, we now see our friends in a way that we, we didn't typically used to see them. Um, we don't just think of them, we don't experience them in real life, we actually see maps of, of these networks. Um, and um, it's these maps of these networks that I think is one of the reasons why network science has become such uh, an important uh, uh, force in, in the first uh, 10 years of this century. Um, indeed, it's, it's really the fundamental transformation of our understanding, not of just how the world works, but of how we work. And people see this and they experience it every day. In the United States, half of all adults log on to Facebook at least once a day. When I, when I tell people this, they're just dumbfounded. You know, they'll say, oh, that's just for, for, for teens, like they're just dating on it or something like that. But, but this is now a global phenomenon. Facebook is now the world's third largest country with somewhere between 600 and 700 million people who are active users. If they could actually make the numbers higher if they included the inactive users, but that's the people who actually interact with the site quite a bit. And they develop these friends and they, they get this new way of seeing the world. And, and they, they wonder, is this something new? Is this a, a, a new reality? Is this something that we haven't experienced before? In fact, um, the way they talk about it sometimes, it sounds very familiar from, from the way the first panel talked about uh, the, the future. Um, we have this vision that the future is going to be this wonderful place where we'll have flying cars and, and, um, and we'll have all this technology and it's going to solve problems. But the fundamental uh, message in uh, these kinds of art forms like the Jetsons was that it was still fundamental humanity. I mean. Um, the, the mom and the dad and the kids, they had the same kinds of problems in spite of all that technology as the people did in the 1960s. And I think this idea of a shelf life leading to a shelf laugh was actually very prescient in the first panel. This idea that, that, that our visions of the future, um, they can become quite dated and they're very influenced by our present. And so wh what I want to do is I want to look into this idea that in fact, what's going on in Facebook and what's going on with our personal realities today um, it has less to do with the future than it has to do with going back to the past. In fact, I want to make the argument that, that in essence what Facebook is doing is it's taking us back to the village, back to village life, back to a life in which we evolved over the last tens and hundreds of thousands of years. In order to be able to make that argument, I first need to though explain a little bit about what a network is so that we can get a handle on, on what, what the topology looks like. Um, everyone has experience with relationships, and everyone has experience with, with what happens when you say first meet someone. So say at this conference you strike up a conversation with someone in the hallway. We can Im imagine that being a fundamental building block of social networks. Um, we can look at it like this. There's a pair of people who are talking to one another, and each one of those people is a circle, and that line is some kind of relationship, a conversation, a friendship. Um, uh, it could be someone that you start dating, it could be a spouse, it could be a business partner. We can specify what that relationship is, but the fundamental nature of those relationships is that they exist between two units, in this case two people. And then once we have the building block, we can start to think about, well, what do we do with these building blocks? Um, I have an 8-year-old and 11-year-old, and they're playing with Legos all the time, so this is the way my mind works. Um, and what you do is you can start to think about, well, what happens when you have many pairs? When you have many of these conversations going on, what will happen is some of these conversations will actually cross over um, and they'll start to connect. You'll see that it's not just one set of people who are, are communicating with one another, it's actually many. And those interconnections actually have a very profound effect on us that we were not able to understand before we saw these maps. When we have this conversation with someone, we do not see the conversation that that person has with other people after you're done. 
And so one of the virtues of seeing ourselves embedded in these networks is it makes us understand that we influence and are influenced by people that we cannot see. And it's not magic. We have the maps. We, we can show you what's going on in other parts of the world where you don't live. But we haven't thought about the world this way up until recently. And the other thing that happens whenever we start to build these blocks is we realize that these connections are not infrequent. They're actually quite frequent, that we live in these interconnected webs. And we will occasionally run into people and we'll play the name game and say, well, do you know, do you know? And, and we discover that it's pretty easy to connect yourself to someone through a small number of steps. This is the small world phenomenon. And it's a consequence of this interconnectedness. Um, and, as a, and as a result, in order to be able to understand the inter interconnectedness, we really need a new paradigm, and that paradigm is, is the paradigm of the social network. We're kind of leaving behind in the 20th century the paradigm of the individual, which has been very useful. It's been, helped us to really understand individual perceptions of reality, individual decision making, but now we need something more because there's a lot of stuff in that relationship. There are a lot of things that go on in the relationship itself. We can no longer think of Robinson Crusoe on his island. We need to put him back in his network to really fully understand him. Now, the place that, that I have actually been thinking about this the most uh, in, over the last 10 years or so has, has been very data-driven. Uh, before I started working directly with Facebook, um, as I have for the past year or so, um, I was working with real-world network data. And the place that we started was in the Framingham Heart Study, where felicitously they had been keeping social network information for the last 32 years. In our first study of this network, we actually looked at obesity and asked the question, is obesity not just epidemic in the sense that it has become more prevalent over time, but is it epidemic in the sense that it might spread from person to person to person through a network that we cannot observe? And so we started making maps like this. We started making maps where we took each individual, the circles in a map like this, and drawing the relationships, in this case the relationships were close friendships, they were spouses, they were siblings, they were neighbors. And what we started to do is we started to see whether or not we could find evidence of an epidemiology of behavior. Is it the case that when, you, when something happens to you, does it then ripple through the network, having an effect on the people that you can see and even the people that you can't see? And so these maps are very useful because we're able to take this bird's eye view of something that we cannot see in our everyday life. And we can Im imbue the, these maps with information. And so, for example, in this case, we've actually made the node size, the circle size in these maps, proportional to body mass index. Larger nodes are literally larger people. And we also colored the nodes to make it clear the ones that were above this threshold of obesity that we're very concerned with in, in the United States today because of the growing prevalence. And so in this case, yellow nodes are, are people who have a body mass index greater than 30. Red nodes are, are those who are below. And in the course of looking at the world this way, we started to see that there are connections between people who have similar behavior. And we started to think about the many different ways why, why we might find those kinds of connections. Maybe we're influencing people. Maybe we're choosing to be friends with the same kinds of people. Maybe we have environments that are affecting us similarly. All three of those processes are critical for understanding how we structure these relationships and the kinds of people with whom we might find new relationships. But the thing that was really extraordinary about this early data set was that not only did we have a snapshot of this thing in, in one moment in time, we were able to see how it evolved over the course of 30 years. And so this is actually um, that first movie that we created from these 5,000 people showing how these relationships evolve. And you can see that relationships will form between people, and the, the um, algorithm we use tries to put those nodes close together. So you might form friends with someone, or you might marry someone. And sometimes those relationships don't last. You stop being friends, you get divorced, and the nodes will fly apart. Um, but one thing that you can definitely tell in this particular image, where we have the same coloring as we had for the obesity study, is that the nodes are getting larger and larger and larger over time. And we can actually follow the sequence, where one node gets larger, and then the next one gets larger, and the next one gets larger. And we can use statistical analysis to characterize the likelihood that this is a process of influence, that this is a process where one person's outcome is actually causally related in some sense, perhaps, to the, to the uh, outcomes of the people that they're directly connected to. 
This really shows us that we are not just Robinson Crusoe, that we're part of this human superorganism, that we're cells in this much larger beast, and that although we're making individual decisions that have a large impact on our lives, those decisions also have an impact on the lives of others, and they ripple through the network, and they affect the overall body of the network, and we are a part of something larger that we, we can't see. One of the things that, that we um, first uh, characterized in these studies is the fact that it's not just the case that, that my behavior is correlated with the people's behavior whom I'm directly connected to, but also those to whom I'm indirectly connected. And so we discovered, for example, that it's possible to predict whether or not you're obese, not just by looking at your friends, but looking at your friends' friends and even your friends' friends' friends. This is that geometry that we were talking about. This geometry of, of, of social space is the degrees of separation, how many steps it takes for you to get from yourself to any other person uh, in, in the global network. And characteristically, we found for a wide variety of behaviors that we found this, this clustering out to three degrees of separation, which means that I could predict your behavior based on someone who was, who was your friend's friend's friend, but not your friend's 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 friend. And we found this for obesity, we found this for smoking behavior, we found this for drinking behavior, we found related effects for divorce, um, for drug use behavior, for sleep behavior, the list goes on and on. Not just for behaviors did we find this, we also found this for affective states. Um, we found this for emotions, and emotions actually find are e more easily transmissible. They transmit between people who have a, a less strong relationship, like neighbors, um, in addition to, tr to being transmitted through friends and, and through, through spouses. And here we have uh, these maps where we can now color people according to whether or not they're happy, the yellow nodes, or sad, the blue nodes. And we can get a sense here, again, that there are strong clusters in this network. If you are surrounded by sad people, the chances are very good that you also are sad. Um, and so one of the things that we started thinking when we looked at, at how strong this regularity was, not just for behaviors, but for emotions and for emotion-related uh, uh, outcomes like depression and loneliness, um, when we started thinking about this, we started wondering why three? Why three degrees of separation? And so we started looking at the anthropology literature to think about what kinds of natural features of human groups might, might in, enforce this kind of, of regularity in these networks that we were looking at. So we looked at this work by Robin Dunbar, and this is a very famous paper where what he tries to do is he tries to infer human network size, human group size, by looking at the brains of a number of different primates. And what he found was is that the more frontal cortex you have as a proportion of your brain, the larger your group size. In fact, it makes this really, really nice line. Um, and those were all relatively objectively measured because we were doing it of another species. We're watching them and recounting them and getting a, a rough idea of what their group size is. And then for human beings, we know what proportion of our brain is devoted to the neocortex. And so we can just go out here and infer that natural group size is about 150. Um, so this is a lovely sort of natural way to make this inference. The, it, there's a lot of evidence in the anthropological literature, for example, um, uh, of today's groups and also groups from the past as well, that groups tend to be order 100 to 200 people in size. In fact, think about the military. In spite of all the advances in technology we have today, the fundamental unit of the military today is about the same size as it was 2,000 years ago. And we even see villages of individuals like these Hutterites that have an explicit rule that once they get to 150 people, they split into two groups because they find groups that are larger than that to be unmanageable. And in fact, not only is it the case that we find evidence for this in the anthropological record, we also find evidence for this, in a sense perhaps, in genetics. Um, and so Nikos Christakis and I have been doing some research on the heritability of our network position, um, looking to see whether or not the, our genes actually, in some sense, influence behaviors that cause us to gravitate towards one part of the network or another, which in turn would have some impact on its structure. Um, and what we find here is that the number of friends you have, how central you are, even whether or not two of your friends are friends with one another, these things are all things that are highly heritable when we, when we compare identical twins to fraternal twins. And we've recently taken specific data on specific genes and have been able to show that the process of homophily, the process of choosing friends who are like us, actually exists at an allelic level, that we tend to be surrounded by people who have similar genes and genotypes to us as well. And so there's evidence here that these, these networks are natural. 
that they're a part or process maybe of evolution. This is a question that we're investigating. How much can we say about where these structures came from? Um, and these, these structures, it's amazing how regular they look. So if we go and look in a, in a college dorm of about 105 people, you'll see a, a, a network of friendships that looks more or less like this. And so if we do have these natural networks that are informed by, by um, that are formed by natural selection, um, one question is, what happens when we take these networks online? Well, the very first thing that you'll notice when we layer on top here the Facebook friendships is that what we get is a big ball of spaghetti. That in fact, what Facebook is doing is, is it's creating a different kind of reality for us in terms of what we normally conceptualize as a friend as we have in these real world networks. The average person today on Facebook has about 150 friends, according to the Facebook definition. But most of those people are not friends in the same sense as, as people that you would discuss important matters with or people that you would spend free time with, which is usually the way that we ascertain uh, close relationships in, in the real world. Now, when we look at the Facebook network, we don't find the same kinds of correlations that we found in that Framingham Heart study when we look at all 150 of those connections. But when we limit the connections to just those people who you're likely to have a close relationship with, so for example, those that you've tagged in a photo, we get a network that looks like this. And once again, we can get clustering of behaviors. And so we find that whether or not you smile in your profile picture or don't smile in your profile picture, this extends out to two degrees of separation in this sub-network of the Facebook network, which suggests that these same processes that we see in these real-world social networks are happening online. It's just they're not happening amongst everyone. They're happening amongst the people who already have this real close uh, social relationship. And in fact, we find this not just for smiling behavior in, in profile pictures, we also find it for overweight. And so we find clusters of overweight men and clusters of overweight women that extend out to two degrees of separation in these Facebook networks as well. And so in some sense, you know, pousse la chance, pousse la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. The network that we, we, we've had for tens of thousands of years, it's still there. It's in there. It's in that Facebook network. And so the question is, why are we thinking about this as being such a different reality? Well, one of the reasons we think of it as such a different reality is because we're focused on tremendous changes in things that are really important to us. And one of the things that, that currently is important to us is privacy. People are very concerned about the fact that now instead of sharing your closest secrets, your baby pictures, all that stuff with your closest friends, now everybody is, is, is seeing these things. It's not just you, it's this is extended group of people that you're not uh, necessarily um, closely connected to. And so you'll get pictures like this that show up on your Facebook page that maybe you didn't want to, to show up because um, you, know, you wanted to have privacy, you wanted to have anonymity, you wanted to be able to go down to the bar on Friday night and have a good time and not have a picture of you show up on the internet the next day. Um, and so the interesting thing about this is that, that people talk about this like this is something new, but it's not new. If you lived here and you got drunk on Friday night, everyone would know. You didn't have any privacy in these villages. And up until recently, this was what life was like. In fact, it's, it's not until the rise of cities that we really get this, this breakdown of these natural human networks. People would move to the cities for economic opportunity, and it's there that they discovered anonymity. It's there that they left their social networks behind. It's there that they discovered privacy. Um, and, and as a consequence of, of living in these cities, we have actually adopted a new taste for something that our brains were not evolved to, to be suited for. And so I'm actually not that surprised that we find that the younger generation is, is adapting quite quickly to a lack of privacy, because a lack of privacy is something that we lived with for a very, very long period of time. And we not only live in these cities where, where we, we have experienced anonymity and privacy, um, we also form relationships with people all over the world. We have rising mobility. This is one of my favorite diagrams from, from uh, all, the, all the research papers I've ever read. It shows uh, a person mapping the extent of travel of his, his grandfather, uh, his great grandfather's grandfather's father and himself. And each generation over the last hundred years um, has increased by a factor of 10 the, the, the area over which they roam. And when we roam, we make relationships with people. We make friends with people. It's no longer just the girl next door that we, we want to have a relationship with. It's, it's those college roommates that don't live next door to us anymore. It's the people that, that we met when we were on vacation. It's, it's these people that, that will move, that we met locally, but then globally, because of this mobility, they move far away. 
Um, and so one of the consequences of, of this huge mobility is that our villages are scattered across the face of the earth. They're no longer local. They're no longer in, in one place. And so as a result of that process, I think that these online social networks hold promise. And the specific promise is that they're going to help us to take us back to the village. They're going to help us to get back in touch with the same kinds of social support that we used to have when we lived in small groups of 150 people. And so just for example, this is a friend of mine who just had some very serious surgery. Now, um, he's not my closest friend, so I probably wouldn't have even found out about this if it wasn't for Facebook. But one of the very first things he did is, is he sent a, a message as soon as he had the surgery, and he noted that you know, he's feeling fine. And all of a sudden, you see 76 comments and 109 likes. This is his village responding to his tragedy. And it's certainly expected that in the cities before this process that you would get phone calls from your closest five or six friends, but you wouldn't have gotten this kind of social support from 150 people. And so in terms of design challenges, one of the things that I think that we're really going to see over the course of the next 10 years is a way to systematize this social support so that we're able to experience reality in, in a better way. We would like to be able to invent massive peer-to-peer -peer health systems where you're not just getting your health from your doctor, you're getting your health from your friends. You're getting your health from your Facebook friends as well because the people that you're weakly connected to have a role to play in terms of helping you as, just as much as, as the people who who are close to you and who are going to have a strong influence on your health behaviors. We can also develop early warning systems. Okay, so how many of you know what the CDC flu uh, uh, warning for San Diego is today? Right, nobody, right? So nobody cares. What if on Facebook you get a message that says three of your friends have the flu today? How do you think that affects your likelihood of getting immunized? It's these personalized warnings using massive passive data and times so that you're not flooded with spam. So you get this message one time a year, the one time a year when it's most likely to be most effective, you should go get immunized today because I have information that's useful to you today about things that you can be doing that will improve your way of life. That's the kind of information that you can get from the global network, but in order to do that, you need to know about people's real world villages. Now there's also peril wrapped up in, in these online social networks. And the peril is nowhere more visible than in this particular network. Now, we are able to make our own village online. That sounds kind of nice, that you can stay in touch with friends who move miles away. You can find new friends. Um, but one of the problems with this is that we have a natural tendency to seek out people who are like ourselves. This is a map of the blogosphere in the, in the US. The red nodes are conservative bloggers. The blue nodes, are, that's right, the blue nodes are liberal bloggers. And the lines are the links between them. And you don't even need some fancy algorithm to tell you that there's clustering here. There's huge clustering. The conservatives are listening to the conservatives, and the liberals are listening to the liberals. And in some sense, this has always happened, but it's much easier now. It's much easier to seek out exactly that person who's just like you. And so as a consequence, I think this raises other design challenges that we need to address in order to avoid these perils. Um, we need to figure out how to maintain diversity. How do you cue people in to being with people who aren't necessarily like themselves? One of the ways that we can do this, actually, is, is through shaping networks. And so just for example, we know that if we randomly assign you to live with a roommate who is clinically depressed, you are more likely to be clinically depressed. And so one of the things that we can do is at points where you start to make friends with people, we can actually figure out ways to bring you in touch with diversity. We already do this in the offline world, but we need to figure out ways to do this in the online world or else I worry that we're all going to start to look like that blogosphere and we're not going to talk to anybody new. This is the real peril of online social networks, but I think that the promise of online social networks makes it absolutely worth it that what we really need to do with this new topology of the world, this new topology of grassroots governance, is to really go back to the village. Thank you very much.